And today, I'll tell you about uh, translation DNA synthesis, but um, you will see a little bit of translation synthesis. And uh, okay, so it's working. And uh, as you know, that our genomic DNA are subject to many environmental and uh, human-induced lesions, and that's why where translation DNA synthesis is needed. In addition, even in the intrinsic, due to the intrinsic DNA structure in our genome, such as uh, telomere, centromere, fragile site, there are intrinsic sequences that cause roadblock to DNA, regular DNA uh, replication. So there are also polymerase helping uh, the genome to be copied, although we don't even know exactly what those polymerase are and how they do it. And uh, as a fact, there are more than perhaps 17 DNA polymerase in just each of our human cells. Many of them actually are involving translation synthesis. And in particular, my group has been studying the Paul Ada in the Y family, Paul Zeta in the B family, and the Paul Nu and a little bit of Paul Zeta in the A family. And uh, the Y family, whoops, the Y family, cannot go back. The Y family polymerase are very well known as translation synthesis um, polymerase, and the poeta, inactivation of poeta leads to the extreme UV sensitivity and UV in the sunlight as, oops, I guess I have no, um, the laser point, so I cannot point. Is it a point here? Okay, all right. Okay, good, thank you. So. Um, but uh, Paul Zeta in the B family, it's known, is essential for cell proliferation, but it's not known why it's needed there. You know, the cell cannot even proliferate, and there's no challenge in environmentally. And the Paul Zeta has been recently shown involving alternative end joining, and how, does, how it does it is still not known. So there's a lot of unknown, and we've been looking into them structurally and biochemically, and I'll just give you one summary slide to um, give you an overview rather than detail, nitty gritty details of each polymerase, how it works. So um, the Y family, for example, Poeta, is have a built, specially built active center, so that those polymerase can look at the lesion and jump over it. For example, Poeta can accommodate the UV lesion and insert the correct nucleotide opposite lesion and give, get over it. And once it's past the lesion, it can hand it back to the normal polymerase. So that's one way of the very brave polymerase and built specifically for that purpose because UV lesion has been around before any organism start to live on this earth. But then there are polymerase in the A and the B family which look like high fidelity replicated polymerase and their active center look just the same as normal polymerase. And so the active center are not meant to accommodate lesion. And how those polymerase bypass lesion? From our studies, we find that those polymerase have a way to get around the lesion. For example, the, um, the B family TLS polymerase in E. coli port 2, and we also now have biochemical data of port theta from human, what it, the enzyme can do is when it encounters the lesion, it cannot really accommodate the lesion in the active center. What it does, it's by looping out the template strand so that it's masked from the active center, and so the polymerase can use the downstream template and synthesize DNA. And once past the lesion, it can do two things. Either keep the uh, looped out lesion looped out. That leads to frame shift, deletional mutation, right? At the end of the day, template is, or primer is shortened. Or it can realign and hand it over to the normal polymerase, and then it leads to the normal mutation, but you have product. Alternatively, we also see that in the A family TRS polymerase, what it can do is that it can loop out the primer, then reuse the upstream template to synthesize DNA. And afterwards, also have two of, uh, alternative. It can keep the primer loop out and the resulting insertional frame shift, which happens in cell two. You know, for example, telomerase needs to do that. And then alternatively, it can realign and then resulting mutation, if uh, anything, but allows the replication fork to proceed. So that's the summary of what we see. And so what's interesting is that it doesn't matter whether the polymerase is high fidelity or translation. 
The one thing in common is that the active center of all polymerase are conserved, even though the tertiary structure can be very different. In the, in the center of the active center, there are those carboxylates showing pink and the red is oxygen residues, very negatively charged. That chelating two magnesium ion, absolutely essential for the catalysis, and that's been established by Tom Stites 20 some years ago. And that in the crystallography structures, we were able to trap this active center alignment by using non-reactive incoming nucleotide. So incoming nucleotide is here, alpha, beta, gamma phosphate. We trap the reaction substrate by replacing the oxygen between alpha, beta um, phosphate. And so it stopped the reaction here because this bond cannot be cleaved. And this is the end of the primer strand. And the three primer OH need to um, attack the alpha phosphate to form the new bond, and the reaction can occur. And this is the state of art of how crystallography lographers approach structural studies of all the antipolymerase, trapping it in the substrate state. And for us, this is the structure of human pore A that we spent many years and several people to, in order to get the crystal structure fully represent the active state. But there is a shortcoming. All the crystal structure is static, and then you, you know, we enjoy this morning's talk. We want to see the dynamics. And everything actually in biology <coughs> is dynamic. When enzyme catalyze the reaction, things move. They didn't stand still, right? So here's a summary from everything we knew some four or five years ago, that polymerase catalyzed the reaction by recognizing the correct incoming nucleotide, and the binding to magnesium ion leads to the catalysis of nucleophilic attack, transition state, and then the release of pyrophosphate while the DNA gets lengthened. And it's acid-based catalysis. And when the incoming nucleotide is incorrect, the polymerase actually doesn't bind tightly and they reject it. And it cannot bind the second metal ion. Only when it's actively recognized the uh, Watson-Crick base pair, then the two metal ion gets, required, uh, gets recruited. And in that reaction, only magnesium or manganese can work to uh, function as a two metal ion. Calcium can allow the binding, but no catalysis. And so that's the state of art. And for many, many years, actually, it's understood, actually, in textbook. The theory, transition uh, state theory, was proposed before my mother was born. <laughs> and it's said that, you know, the reaction is such the enzyme is uh, stabilized the substrate product state in a sort of uh, an equilibrium. And what enzyme can do is reduce energy requirement to reach the transition state so that reaction can go, work, go forward fast. And then nobody have ever seen the transition state. And it was drawing textbook as a <laughs> pentacovalent phosphorotransfer reaction. And it works for all polymerase and kinase and ATPase, et cetera. And we just took it for granted for 80 years. So we never thought a second way how reaction can occur. So given that, as I mentioned, biology is all dynamic, right? And it's like a horse running. And we will have been working for decades that looking at enzyme bound to a substrate, the reaction is prevented. And I suspect that when reaction happens, something rearranged. And we can imagine how it rearranged the electrons and protons. But in fact, if you see a horse running, when the man standing on the horse looks very different from the when the horse is running. And it's a question whether one can look at this image and imagine how the horse runs. It's the same question as when we look at enzyme substrate complex. Can we imagine how the reaction really proceeds? The answer is probably not. So when we have the crystal with the active center perfectly aligned with substrate, and we wonder if we can have the reaction happen in crystal. And in fact, for many people who are not crystallographer, you worry that Molecules in crystal are not really active. They're in the crystal form, in a solid. But in, in fact, the crystal contains 50% of solvent. And the most enzyme in the crystalline form actually could be active. In fact, the very first enzyme, urease, was crystallized by human deliberately and being shown in 20, uh, 1926 by James Summoner. To, he wanted to prove the crystal he grew actually is urease. And he showed that when diffused the urea into the crystal, actually the enzyme turned urea into ammonia. 
and for that work he received the Nobel Prize. So that was the very first case showing enzyme actually is active in crystalline form. And 20 some years ago, Lorena Beasy was working on DNA polymerase and I think she fascinated the whole community of scientists that she showed that DNA polymerase is active. She showed that she can interfuse in the nucleotide and the DNA in the crystal gets longer and longer and longer. And, but in her form, it's always the product, no incoming nucleotide. So what we did is devise a way to actually make the reaction happen in crystal because those work were published some years ago in uh, 2012, so I'm going to make it very brief, that we were able to trap the enzyme substrate complex without reaction happen in the native form by omitting the essential magnesium in the crystallization condition. So that crystal form, and after crystal form, then we soak the crystal in buffer that at pH neutral, that reaction can go forward. And then we move the crystal into buffer containing magnesium, just one millimolar magnesium, mimicking the condition in physiological inside the cell. And then we can observe a reaction happen. And by freezing the crystal at various time to point at the liquid nitrogen temperature, we can stop the reaction. Then we observe the um, reaction intermediate by X-ray crystallography. So, and this method has been very, very successful. And since 2012, many groups have used the same approach, study DNA polymerase, nuclease, and other enzymes. And so, what I want to show you is actually something new since then. And uh, um, it took us many years, but how we first represent you, present you the uh, uh, conundrum. So, when we did the in-crystal reaction, what we saw is when the, once the crystal is exposed, one millimolar magnesium, after 40 seconds, we saw the two metal binding sites were occupied by magnesium and perfectly aligned. However, the reaction didn't take place. There's a delay after two metal ion binding. And then we waited for another 40 seconds. Then we started to see product. As you can see, the bond between the end of the primer and the alpha phosphate occur. So this incoming nucleotide become part of the product and the pyrophosphate start to form. So that's very nice. And we wait for another 60 seconds. <coughs> Suddenly we saw a third magnesium showing up. And this third magnesium ion is not coordinated by the enzyme at all. It's coordinated perfectly by the two product, okay? So, uh, as I said, that we can superimpose, actually not superimpose, in every time point during the course of reaction, what we see in the crystal is that it's a combination of substrate showing in yellow and the product showing in blue. And as the time going, at the beginning, whoops, something is not quite right. Okay, so they loaded a previous slide, I think. Oh, I made it wrong. So. Um, the problem is that with time going, that substrate showing yellow gets decreased and the product showing blue gets increased. And the only conundrum is that the third metal ion, it seems to be appearing after product formation. And the Sam Wilson applied the same methodology to the X family poor beta polymerase study and he's published beautiful paper in Cell and in Nature, study the reaction incorporating raw incoming nucleotide AOXOG. And what he saw is that the third metal ion also occur in poor beta. And because the third metal ion can only bound stably with the product, he called it product metal ion. And that we were looking at this enzyme reaction, and we saw the third metal ion coming in, and we didn't really know what's its role. And it bugs us not knowing what its function, whether it's stabilized product or it's involving the reaction. So I had a post, uh, a graduate student working on that, tried to understand the real chemistry of reaction. And after two years, he tried different concentration of magnesium, different temperature, he gave up. He doesn't think it will work. So when a new postdoc came in two years ago, he was switching the attack and using the manganese, which is heavier than magnesium and support the reaction, can easily be monitored using X-ray crystallography. And so suddenly we saw the third metal ion coming in at the same time as the product. And it's totally correlated. And the correlation is good. And for biologists, we often just you know, stop at the phenomenon, right? But Jan start, decided to go a step further. So what he did is because he can monitor the manganese very easily, what he did is he did an in-solution study to see how much magnesium and how much manganese is needed 
for this poeta to catalyze the reaction. And he found for magnesium, he only need half a 0.7 millimolar. For manganese, he needs a lot more, about three millimolar. That's in solution. And he then very laboriously took this reaction to measure the uh, metal ion affinity in the crystal. And because people have done kinetic study in solution for many years, if two metal ion binding sites have very similar KD, you cannot separate them, right? But in crystal, he can see every single one. So here's the plot of he measured the binding constant of each metal ion in crystal. The A and the B site are canonical to metal ion binding. And each of the uh, triangle is one crystal at one particular magnesium or manganese concentration at a particular time. And when he plotted A and B binding affinity, what you can see, it's very, very high affinity. That's the manganese. It's much, much tighter than whatever the solution is needed of the manganese to support the reaction. But then when he looked at the C site, now you see the C site affinity for manganese approach the solution requirement of manganese to support the reaction. And for people like biochemist, it really shows that what's the determinant of the reaction requirement for the metal ion is the C site. So not only the C site correlate very well with the product, but it is very much represent what's the concentration needed for reaction. Then Yang did a killer experiment. Because the manganese affinity for A and the B site, the conventional site, very, very, very tight binding, and the C is much lower. So he chose a concentration of manganese, which um, is here, one millimolar. It satisfied A and the B binding site, but it's too low for the C site, the third metal ion binding site to bind. So what he saw is that by 10 minutes, the A and the B site is fully bound by manganese which is not surprising. And then he waited 20 minutes and 30 minutes and hoping the reaction will happen. But actually, he hoped it won't happen. And it doesn't happen. For 30 minutes, he waited with a two-metal ion bound, canonical two-metal ion bound, no reaction, suggesting that the third metal ion is absolutely needed for reaction, right? So then there are other things to be considered. The third metal ion bound to the substrate or product, right? It's absolutely required for reaction, yet it's not really comfortably bound to the substrate. It will clash with the substrate. It's too close to the alpha phosphate. And also, before the third metal ion bound, a protein side chain arginine 61 is stabilizing the substrate. So the question is whether if he removed the arginine will make the reaction go faster and better. So he did an experiment replaced, made the arginine to alanine mutation, and he saw in crystal, first he did the in solution, actually the reaction is slower with the arginine removed, which hinders the third metal ion binding. And the reason is because without arginine, the mutant showing blue compared to the, the pink color of wild type, the substrate is slightly misaligned without the arginine pinning it down. In the resulting crystal reaction, he shows the two metal ion binding is not affected. By 40 seconds, they're there. What's affected is because the misalignment of the substrate, the third metal ion doesn't come in for a long time. So it takes like another 120 seconds rather than just 40 seconds. Misalignment of substrate makes it harder to trap the third metal ion. So that's again makes sense. The slow reaction, what well, we see the delay between the two metal ion binding and the reaction is because waiting for the third metal ion to come in. And the problem, as I point out, it's really a terrible thing. The third metal ion doesn't bind the substrate. It binds product, yet it's required for the reaction. How does that happen? So we thought the way to do is probably enzyme allow the substrate to bind, but it relies on the thermal energy, the thermal motion, the vibration, right? The Brownian motion. That allowed the entrance of the third metal ion. To test this hypothesis, so Young conducted the reaction in crystal in two steps. He first soaked the crystal in one millimolar, one millimolar manganese, allowed AB site to bind. Then he shifted the temperature to have the reaction happen in 4 degree, 12 degree, 20 degree, 37 degree, to see if there's a temperature dependence of the thermal motion to capture the third metal ion. And to make sure those temperature change doesn't change the diffusion rate of the metal ion, he did a control experiment to just look at the A site, which is a high affinity site. And at various temperature, he can see at 60 second, A site is invariably bound, no problem. But the C site, 
This is the temperature. At the low temperature, nothing happened. With the increase of temperature, he saw, he saw the increased binding of the sea site. And the, simultaneously, he saw the increase occurring of the product. Okay, so here's almost the end. Sea site is absolutely needed. Binding of it need energy, need thermal motion. And what does it do? What does C site metal ion do? The A is there, A and the B is there already. So the C site is bound, inserted between the two product. And the binding is incompatible with substrate because in the substrate state, these two are covalent linked. And it has to insert itself as if it will help to break this existing bond. Okay? And the driving the reaction to going forward to have this new bond formation. It's totally opposite to every textbook says. The nucleophilic attack is starting from the OH rather than the bond formation. And intermediate transition state actually is not the same as substrate state. It acquires a new metal ion. And you can imagine the new metal ion binding provide enough energy to overcome any of the barrier that the reaction have to go through. So that's how we understand the reaction occur. The enzyme really select incoming nucleotide. When it's correct, then it can proceed to attract two metal ions, and that's coordinate between the enzyme and the substrate. And it's very nice when it's bound, actually align the substrate perfect for reaction. But the reaction couldn't happen, even though it's now at a high energy level with the substrate perfectly aligned. And with some motion, things vibrate. But the vibration in itself is enough, is not enough to overcome the transition state, but only create an opportunity for the third metal ion to come in. Once it get a footing, now it comes in to push the reaction over the transition state. Now the product can form, all right? And that's how it works, we think. And the lucky is that Sam Wilson have shown this third metal ion exists in Paul Beta, and then more recently, it's unpublished, showing Paul Mu, and the same location, even though the environment of the certain metal ion binding is very different from the enzyme, but the enzyme doesn't involve in the certain metal ion binding. So what we think is that now we have a new paradigm for how reaction enzyme catalysis occur, which is very satisfying. And it's too bad that this meeting occurred now rather than a month ago. If it's a month ago, I can claim this is unpublished result. So, <laughs> Enzyme helped the alignment of substrate, but then it cannot really reach the transition state, which enzyme never really you know, provide energy right, to overcome the reaction um, barrier. But what happens, it's helping the substrate to trap the third metal ion. And with the binding of the third metal ion, provide enough energy to overcome the transition state, and the product occurs reaction occur, and the third metal ion coming in is not just neutralizing the charge, that's part of the equation because the transition state is very, very negative charge rich, than the, more so than the substrate. It helps the breaking this bond just by magnesium that have very stiff coordination ligand uh, requirement. And then when the product form, we also observe the ASAP metal ion get bleached out. And by letting go the ASAP metal ion, that prevent the reaction going backwards. And so the metal ion really helps the protonation, deprotonation, and the, the, overcome the transition state energy barrier. And so this is the end of my talk today. And the work really accumulated from many, many years uh, trying and hard work. Started from collaboration with Fumio Hanaoka, whose group discovered the POETA and the UV sensitivity is due to that particular uh, XPV patient is due to this mutation in activation of POETA. And we published the very first structure of POETA complex with UV lesion, CPD, in 2010 with f four people's work, five years. And then in 2012, Teruya and Yezhao pioneered this in crystal reaction, which now is broadly used by many crystallographer. And then very lately, Yang Gao, who take the, the, the study to a new level, that to visualize the chemistry, and then we think it's a, it's a new paradigm for how enzyme uh, catalysis occur. And thank you for your attention.